Hello, everybody. I'm Phil from Element 14 Community. Uh, today, we're joined by Clark Jarvis, who is Software Product Marketing Manager at Infineon Technologies. Hi, Clark. How are you doing? I'm great, Phil. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yes, uh, very exciting. Nice. This uh, webinar is in collaboration with the At The Core Design Challenge, which is over on the Element 14 Community. Um, use uh, the uh, PSOC 62 to build something really, really cool. I would love if you guys could all check out the links on the right-hand side and uh, go visit that design challenge. Uh, Clark is going to be talking today about an introduction to the Modus Toolbox uh, and some of the cool new features that are available. Um, if anybody hasn't visited uh, an Element 14 uh, webinar before, uh, all of the windows that you can see in front of you right now uh, are movable. So if they've uh, spawned in a place that you don't particularly like them, you can drag them, you can resize them. Um, all of the links on the right-hand side are clickable. On the left-hand side, we have a live Q&A box. We will be taking questions all the way through and answering them at the end. So uh, feel free to say hi in the box on the left. Um, we are live. This is live, and uh, Clark is with us here today. Um, so I will uh, not wait any longer. Please move any windows around, and uh, I will introduce you to Clark. Please take it away. All right. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, and, and as Phil mentioned, right, this is done in collaboration with the At The Core Design Challenge. Uh, and one of the critical things about the, the At The Core Design Challenge is really the focus on dual core. Um, and that is one of the new features that is available or one of the new features that is improved inside of Modus Toolbox. And, and that's really what I wanted to try to, to capture or cover today is a specific focus on developing inside the Modus Toolbox with that kind of dual core concept in mind. So we're going to we'll go through a couple of, of presentation slides. I want to try to keep those fairly light, right? Go through those pretty quickly because... At the heart of this, I actually was just going to share my screen and we're going to go through kind of four main concepts uh, around creating a project and working with a project with a specific focus on, on dual core. So we'll get to that. Um, and again, when I think when we go into the actual uh, screen sharing, you know, kind of see my desktop, as Phil mentioned, you can blow that screen up, make it a little bit bigger so that you can see the actual tools. It may be a bit small, depending on what screen you're on. All right, so let's dive into this. The first uh, kind of question that I want to, to go over is kind of what is Modus Toolbox? I want to talk about that, make sure you guys have a, a clear understanding of what Modus Toolbox is and all of the various uh, pieces about it. Uh, so Modus Toolbox is a modern extensible development environment. So what does that mean? Right? It, it's a collection of tools, of resources, of everything that you need to really get started developing with an Infineon microcontroller. There are going to be um, kind of two main categories, or I like to describe it as kind of two main categories of, of things that you're going to be working with. There are the actual development tools that we see here on the, the bottom left, and then there's the runtime software. So for the development tools, these are going to be the applications when you go to Infineon.com and you download Modus Toolbox. That file is going to install several applications onto your, your development machine, your laptop, your PC. And those are going to be everything that you need to create new applications, to be able to manage the, the software libraries that you're pulling into your application, or even the, the specific versions of these software libraries that you want to use. It's going to have tools that enable you to configure the device. So I'm going to set up the, the clocking structure this particular way, or I need to route these particular pins. I'm going to use these pins in this, this way or that way, or these are the peripherals that I want. And there's a, a, a visual uh, UI, user interface, to allow you to set up those different peripherals with drop-down menus. And there's error checking and things like that. Um, so those are all of the tools, and that's in addition to what you would typically expect um, from a, an IDE, um, where we have, uh, you're going to be doing your editing, your code editing, the compiling of the project, and doing the, the debugging, and that's in a specific um, IDE. So these are a, a collection of all these tools that work in concert together to provide that development experience, is really what I want to try to capture with Modus Toolbox. Then on the other side of that is all of the runtime software. And this is all of the, the building blocks. These are the pieces and the, the APIs, the libraries, the middleware that you use to develop an application. And these are typically hosted 
in a GitHub repositories, uh, but you don't have to go to GitHub directly and, and, and clone them or download them. You can. That's certainly one path that is available. Uh, all of the development tools uh, interface directly with GitHub to be able to pull that content directly into the tools. <clears throat> so as we go to the next slide, you see a little bit more kind of going one level uh, deeper into seeing what really is available inside of Modus Toolbox. And in this uh, kind of chart, this graph, I like to kind of work from the bottom up. Um, first of all, there's uh, more than just the tools themselves. There is a Modus Toolbox community where you can certainly answer questions and, and get guidance there. There is API documentation, and, and we'll show that. We'll talk a little bit about this in the webinar as well. And then I mentioned the GitHub repositories as well. Building up from that, there are the BSPs. These are the board support packages. This is the, the kind of foundational piece where we provide support for specific development kits for specific devices. And you'll see a range of Infineon products like the PSOC 4, PSOC 6 devices, XMC, the industrial microcontrollers, USB controllers like the, the programmable USB controllers like PMG devices, AROC connectivity devices, and Bluetooth devices. So quite a range of devices that are enabled inside of Modus Toolbox that you can then develop application code for. So as you're developing that application code, again, a, a wide range of resources available in terms of middleware. We'll have middleware focused on human machine interface. Uh, these are typically like the capacitive touch. Uh, there's graphics coming from partners, connectivity solutions, uh, various security packages, voice and audio, machine learning, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and more. And this is a, a certainly an area where Modus Toolbox continues to grow to bring in more middleware that's available from Infineon, as well as middleware that's available from Infineon partners, all directly accessible inside of the Modus Toolbox tools themselves. Help get started, lots of application or code examples and reference designs that you can use to start your application or to use as kind of educational tools to understand how does this particular peripheral work, right? And how do I use the APIs that are available for me to start developing with? And then the tools that make it all kind of come together cohesively will be tools like a project creator, library manager, the actual Eclipse IDE itself, as well as other partner IDEs. More about that on the next slide. Uh, configurators and tuners, we'll go through some more of that. And then truly at the heart of what Modus Toolbox is, um, is really this make-based build system that can be used to, to do all the compilation and bring everything together. <clears throat> So I touched on it just briefly um, in talking about uh, the different IDEs. So when we typically as developers, when we go into start a project, this is the main tool that we sit at in front of, you know, kind of hour after hour, day after day. Um, it's the workhorse that, that we use. We have a variety of supported IDEs. There is an Eclipse IDE that uses the ARM GCC compiler. And this is included, this is bundled with the Modus Toolbox installation. So we install all the goodness of all of the various tools that are part of Modus Toolbox. This is one of those tools that's available. And I will be using that in when we do the, the walkthrough of the different features. I will also be showcasing, I'll kind of switch back and forth between the Eclipse IDE as well as Microsoft Visual Studio Code. Uh, these two IDEs in particular are free for anyone to use. Uh, so I wanted to make sure we kind of showcase some of the workflows that are available within those two IDEs. Also support for IR's Embedded Workbench, ARM's Microcontroller Development Kit with their Microvision IDE. And for those tools, those are um, pay-for tools, commercial tools, users that have licenses for those probably know how they work. So we don't spend too much time on those in um, this webinar, but those are fully supported and available as well. From the configurators, and we'll look at a few of these um, later on in the webinar, but we've got a project creator, help you create projects, a library manager, help you manage libraries that are inside of your application, device configurator, configure your device, right? So hopefully those are pretty straightforward. Uh, there is a BSP assistant, and this is a new tool that was introduced as part of 3.0 that's really there to provide a kind of a graphical way, a graphical tool to help guide you through taking an existing BSP that's maybe targeting one of the Infineon dev kits 
and then being able to port that over to your actual hardware, right? If you've got a custom board or a custom PCB that you want to run the code on, this tool is going to help get you there. It's going to help port that, that over. Uh, this webinar in particular, at least in its um, kind of alignment with the At The Core Design Challenge, most of that's being done on a development kit anyways, so we won't cover too much of that um, in this webinar. Going beyond, there's many other uh, configurators and tools. There's ones around doing secure policy for secure devices, for doing cap sense configuration and, and runtime tuning on those. Uh, other ones that are really targeted at specifics of the hardware. How do I set up QSPY, the smart IO IP, segment LCDs, and then going higher level, machine, machine learning, USB. So lots of tools that are really there to kind of help provide some type of, of guidance on how do I how do I set this up? How do I configure it so that it's going to do what I need it to do um, and pull that code into my project? So when we talk about Modus Toolbox itself, um, there are a couple of of kind of key pillars, at least for me, that I say, you know, this is really what captures what Modus Toolbox is, um, what the development experience that we're trying to create with Modus Toolbox. And I have four four pillars, and we'll go through each of them. Uh, the first one is the development workflow um, and the flexibility of a development workflow that Modus Toolbox provides. We already talked about the different uh, options you have for working with the IDE. You, are, you can use the bundled Eclipse version, VS Code, IR, Kyle. Uh, but you can also even go down to a command line, right? A lot of engineers, especially when they really get into doing um, you know, really kind of low-level development or, or tying it into continuous integration, build systems, a lot of work is done at these command line levels. Um, and Modus Toolbox, the whole make-based build system, even interfaces into these different configurators, the different project APIs, and things. they all work at a command line level. I'll even show a little bit of that in the in the workshop piece of it. So lots of flexibility. I really want to, to provide an environment that lets you as the developer develop the way that you're comfortable with. It fits the needs of how you develop, and you get to define that. Then it comes to the middleware management, and this is a this is a great thing with Modus Toolbox is the ability to to reach out into GitHub to be able to pull in these various libraries. Whether I'm using a particular, or I need to bring in free RTOS or a connectivity stack or uh, some other piece of middleware, some sensor library, and to be able to have those files get pulled directly into Modus Toolbox, and with clear documentation and guidance on, okay, hey, I've got this code now. How do I use it? How do I integrate it into my project? So really cool feature about Modus Toolbox there. And then when we get to the actual development, right, I'm actually developing with um, the different APIs, the drivers that are provided. There are various levels of drivers provided as well. I can go all the way down, if I want to, I can go all the way down to the hardware and start doing register reads and writes. But for the most part, I'm working with uh, kind of the, the low level peripheral driver libraries when I want to be very close to the hardware. I want to kind of maximize the efficiency and the flexibility and, and take advantage of a lot of the capabilities that are available on a, a very specific uh, IP that's on the device. And that's great. Um, but sometimes we want to be a little bit more uh, high level than that. Maybe we're interfacing with a piece of middleware. Or I want my code to be extremely portable. Uh, there are various abstraction, or there, there is an abstraction layer, a hardware abstraction layer that provides very easy to use, simple APIs that sit at a higher level. Um, and these same APIs will, can be used across different portfolios that are that have this HAL capability and provides a lot of, of flexibility. And it's not an, an either or uh, situation, right? If I'm looking at my project, um, I, there's maybe a timer or a uh, some particular IP that I need to be very close to uh, the hardware and I can use the peripheral driver libraries for that. And then for the where my code is running in a, maybe a, a different thread or a different um, piece that I'm working with a connectivity stack, then I can use the how drivers for that. Or maybe it's just a simple GPIO or a simple PWM signal. I don't really need as much control. I can use the, the higher level abstraction layers for that. And a lot of that really leads into the application portability, whether it's that flexibility of the abstraction layers, 
It's the various tools that allow you to kind of retarget what device I'm working with um, and, and the ability to, to use the, uh, the library manager to actually swap out the actual BSP that I'm working with. It's very easy to retarget different hardware. And so a lot of application portability inside of Modus Toolbox. So, of course, um, with the, the association with the At The Core design challenge and the introduction or the, the recent release of Modus Toolbox 3.0, I wanted to talk a, about some of the features around the dual core development and that experience inside of Modus Toolbox. Now, in previous versions, it was still possible to work with dual core applications, to, to be able to program them, to even debug them. Uh, but debugging was done historically um, kind of on a single core at a time. So I would debug the, the CM4, and then I could close that session, and then I could debug the CM0, which is the, the smaller core on the device. With 3.0, um, it's now possible to uh, do simultaneous debugging. And in addition to that, there was a lot of uh, kind of app structure changes, a lot of infrastructure changes to support this. Um, kind of the, at the top level, three main things that changed. There is a new multi-core application file structure. And I'll, I'll highlight this in the, the walkthrough. But there is effectively a top-level application folder. And then inside of that, you'll have the individual subfolders that are for each core project. So a project for the CM4, project for the CM0. And then there's a shared BSP folder where all of the device configurator files, um, all the clock settings, all of the auto-generated code get placed inside of this BSP folder. And the these make commands, especially if you're working kind of at a command line level, I can call these at an application level. I can do is let's make the application and it will build both projects or I can go down to the individual projects and still use the, uh, the make file commands there as well. Some of the tools that we have um, that have a specific um, kind of twist to them or specific feature and capability around dual core, the library manager, as you would expect, I have multiple cores inside of my project and I'm managing those libraries. The library manager says, well, I want to add this library to this core. I can bring something into CM0's project or into CM4's project. The device configurator also allows me to generate an initialization core and kind of that application at that global level, right? So I can develop uh, initialization code for both cores and have it um, be initialized when the device first boots up. So I know everything kind of comes up correctly, as well as an, uh, a suite of or a collection of code examples that turn on dual, or that make use of dual core. And we see a lot of these. There's just a few right now, but we're having more and more um, that will be coming out over the next couple of weeks um, to create more of these dual core use case examples. And that's also just one more quick plug for the challenge itself. Um, that's really kind of what we're looking to see is um, the kind of the creativity of what people can really accomplish and what type of, of concepts can people come up with in using these, these two cores together. And then as I kind of highlighted before, that's the, then the actual debugging itself, that ability at least inside of the Eclipse IDE that's bundled with Modus Toolbox, as well as Microsoft VS Code, uh, support for doing simultaneous debugging in a single instance of those IDEs. And, and we'll see that um, in, the, in the walkthrough. And as well as both IR and Kyle also support uh, dual core debugging um, following how the, the support that they had provided before, I think. And some of them spawned two sessions, but they've got their own kind of process for doing dual core, but fully capable and supported with the projects provided by Lotus Toolbox. So we talked, um, that, that's kind of the software side of it. I've, I've got this slide here to talk a little bit uh, specifically about PSOC 6. Uh, we've, we've talked primarily about Modus Toolbox so far. I wanted to give a little bit of an overview, or at least a preview, or not a preview, but a, uh, an overview of the uh, the PSOC 6, specifically the PSOC 6.2 um, architecture, which is a dual-core architecture. Uh, it's meant to be a very flexible, high-performance dual core architecture really targeting at the IoT space, optimized for, for low power system, um, power consumption performance. Um, and one of the key things, and this is also a key thing for the uh, at the core design challenge is the 
leverage of the inner processor communication. This is IP that allows you to communicate between the cores, um, whether it's uh, using semaphores or uh, message queues or actually even commands being sent between the cores. Um, in the, the diagram here, you'll notice there is some kind of color coding. Um, there are some peripherals that are, in this example, assigned to the CM4. There are a couple of peripherals that are assigned, to kind of in the bluish color, assigned to the CM0. This is just illustrative. Um, this is not some type of a limitation or saying these are the only peripherals that are somehow hard-coded to the peripheral. It's just showing a possible use case. In fact, all peripherals are available to both cores. So as start to think about different ways I'm going to use multi-core, right? Lots of flexibility in terms of how I'm going to make those assignments and which core is going to be able to access different type of peripherals. So just want to make that clear that there's a, there's kind of full flexibility there between those two cores. All right, so let's, let's jump into the, um, the actual walkthrough portion and a little bit talking a little bit about the different concepts that I want to cover as part of this, this walkthrough. So first, covering topics around getting started, right? So how, how do I get started and what's available for me to get started? We're going to look at the project creator. Um, this is where we'll be able to pull in uh, a new project, kind of a fresh, clean project, or being able to use one of the code examples that are already available. So we'll look at both of those kind of flows. Then we'll go into kind of what I'm calling adapting the project, right? How do I make this project do what I want it to do for my use case? So we'll look at the device configurator. We'll look at the memory or the library management, uh, bringing you able to pull in different libraries. And we'll also look at linker scripts. And this is an important one for the dual core because as we put more and more code into the, the CM0 space, uh, the, the default settings may not be big enough, right? We're going to quickly, the, uh, the default projects just give you a tiny little uh, amount of flash that's associated to the CM0. So we'll make sure we understand how to, to give us a little breathing room on the CM0 side. <clears throat> and then, of course, the communication between the cores. Because working with dual cores, right, I can just put two independent things in them and go let them do their own thing. Uh, but where it gets really interesting is when we start having um, actual interaction, right? How do I get synchronization between these two cores? And we'll, we'll explore a little bit about semaphores, about message queues, about command pipes. Um, if you've worked with a, uh, an, an embedded OS before, these are probably terms you're familiar with. It's basically kind of a hardware implementation of what we, the types of concepts we see between tasks now happening between cores. And then finally, we'll do a quick little, um, preview or a, uh, a showcase demonstration of some of the uh, simultaneous uh, debugging as well. So let me switch over. I'm going to share my desktop. While, uh, while clocks uh, switching over to sharing, uh, we just a reminder that this is a live webinar. Um, the Q&A box uh, is, is open. We've already got uh, questions from Francesco, Steve, Dave, a few others. Um, we have quite a few people in. So hello to Dave. Hello to Christian, Terry, Scott. We have uh, Karthik Kumar. We have Megan. Uh, so uh, just uh, for anybody that started a little late, the VOD for this, the video on demand, will be available almost immediately afterwards. Um, so keep those questions coming. We will be answering them at the end, and they are coming through to us. Okay, great. Yeah, awesome, guys. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen. I'm sharing, right now I have the Eclipse IDE um, that's bundled with Lotus Toolbox opened. Uh, what is nice about this particular IDE is, is we've taken some extra steps to integrate or to at least provide uh, quick access to a lot of the other tools. Um, in specific, um, we're going to first start at work. This is kind of the getting started piece of it. And so a lot of it centers around uh, creating a new application. And in this case, here in the quick panel, and you'll find in the quick panel, there's always, uh, this is where I'll be going to quite a bit to kind of showcase some of the capabilities and features that, um, that are specifically inside of the Eclipse IDE. And if I click on this new application, it's actually gonna open up the, uh, the project creator 
tool. And there, there's other ways that we can open this up as well. It's going to go out and it's going to query the uh, the GitHub system to see what are all the latest um, boards that are supported, uh, the latest projects that are supported. And we can go through and see, you know, there's quite a big list of different development boards that are available. Um, filtering, so if you knew the actual dev kit part number, you can type that in. I'm going to select, in this case, I have I've actually have a, a PSOC 6.2 S2 connected to my machine right now. So I can select that as the uh, the reference BSP, hit next, and I can see a list of the various uh, code examples or starting examples that I can see. So you can see quite a bit, all in different categories, lots of lots of code examples that I can use. Um, there are a couple of dual core ones. Um, there's a, an empty one. We'll look at that. That's a great place to at least have all of the, the framework that I would need for a dual core application. Um, there's also a, a, a semaphore one. So this is actually uh, showcasing uh, one of the concepts around IPC. So th that's a good one as well. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and close this. I've actually already cloned this um, project prior to this. So I'm just going to close the uh, the new project wizard. Had I, had I um, went ahead and hit continue, I would have gotten a project much like this. So this is the, uh, the dual CPU IPC semaphore. And so let's look just real quickly um, inside of the Eclipse IDE. You can see it kind of organizes it. I've got a folder here. This is this top level application folder. Underneath it, I've got my individual core projects. So you can see the first one here is associated to the CM0 <clears throat> and the second for the, the CM4. And each of those would have their own set of, of libraries, their own main.c file in this case, their own make file that's going to tell me how to make um, that build that actual project. Um, this one um, also has a shared folder. There, there is an additional header file that it uses to, to make sure that when we compile these applications, they're, they're referencing the same header files. So we have to be careful about how we make changes between the two cores. And then there's the BSP itself. Um, so this is common between um, the, the two subcore projects. It's at this higher application level. And this is going to have all of the, the definitions of what our board is, all of the startup code for it, all of the code that we would auto-generate when we run things like the device configurator, the Capsons configurator, all of that, uh, all of the generated code is going to be inside of this file itself. Uh, linker files, which we'll, we'll look at in, in, in just a bit. So um, that kind of showcased how to create a new project inside of um, inside of the Eclipse IDE, let's say, I, for instance, I was using the uh, VS Code. Um, I could also, and I've got a, a shortcut set on my desktop, so I could open up Moda Shell, and I could, I can go. Oh, sorry, wait, I don't want to do Moda Shell. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go straight into Project Creator. So I've got a link for Project Creator. So this is the same UI that that we just saw before that the the Eclipse IDE opened up, and I can go through those same steps. And let me go grab my board real quick. This is the one I have connected. And for this case, I'm gonna I'm gonna grab the dual core, the the, the empty application, and I've I've got a selection of which IDE I would like to build this for. Right, we can see the four that we've referenced um, throughout this presentation. So I'm gonna build this for the Microsoft Visual Studio Code. And when I hit create, it's gonna go. It's gonna pull all the files, everything that I need um, from this repository that's hosted um, at the Infineon GitHub page. It's also going to go through and check any dependencies because there are various libraries that uh, may be required for this. It'll make sure I've got all the, the correct um, versions of it that are set up to work with this particular BSP. And then it'll go in and, and actually create the VS Code um, project files itself. And What's also nice, and, and one thing that I um, want to make sure we point out is once this once this dialog completes, then you can see a, a log of messages flowing out underneath. <clears throat> there, uh, there, there's instructions specifically on okay, I've, you know, I've created the project now. How do I actually go and, and use it as well? Right? How do I actually open it up and use it inside of in this case inside? Of VS Code. So pay attention to those. Um, I know some of the, the IDEs may have some uh, additional steps or additional configurations that you have to set up. And, and even as I tell you, this is go follow these instructions. Um, I'm actually not going to follow 
the, the instructions that are provided. I'm gonna I'm gonna open up the project a, a slightly different way that I'll I'll show here in just a little bit. In fact, let me uh let me just minimize this for right now. <clears throat> I, I started to open up earlier, um, and I'll open it up again. I have a, a modus shell application, and this is kind of a, a command line uh, shell or terminal uh, for modus toolbox. It's actually based, at least for Windows, um, it's it's uh, it's based on top of a, a uh, an instance of Sigwin. Uh, it is going to have all of the the paths, the the environment variables, the things set up for me to be able to use the command line and the make system for Modus Toolbox. And so I've got a uh, a workspace directory set up at the core webinar, and this is where I'm. I just cloned in this project. So if uh, this should be done now, but you can see that uh, I've got my project. I'm using this uh, this file directory. And it's created all the files for me. So let's jump into, I just cloned the dual CPU. Make sure I can type in it. I did blow this up a little bit so that it uh, would be easier to see. And this is the actual workspace file that was created for me. And this is maybe just a personal preference. I like having the Modus shell open and I'll, I'll show why. Um, Cause I can do things like I'm gonna, I want to open this up in VS Code. Well, VS Code has a shortcut code and I can pass in my workspace file and that will that will automatically launch VS Code. It will bring in my project, it'll bring in everything that I need to be able to get that up and running. Inside of VS Code, you'll see uh, it, it doesn't uh, nest the projects like the Eclipse does, but you'll see very similar, you see a top level application folder. We see our CM0, CM4, and then our MTB shared. And I did. I, I neglected to talk a little bit about the MTB shared folder. As we use things like the library manager and other tools, these are going to pull libraries into our workspace. And by default, it pulls them into a shared folder. I thought I had multiple projects inside of my workspace. Uh, it doesn't have to re-download those um, if they're the same version. I can I can specifically ask um, Modus Toolbox to put them to local to my project, but by default they go into the MTB shared folder. And so that's a uh, that's those are kind of the basic concepts of of getting started, right? Um, so in this case, I in VS Code I created an empty application. It's a great starting point for being able to have a, a blank slate. If you looked at the application itself, it really just kind of comes up and gives you a, a blank for loop. Uh, so a good place to kind of start doing the actual development. In the uh, Modus Toolbox, the Eclipse IDE, I actually brought in one of the code examples. And so you'll see that this code will have um, more things going on. It's actually doing something. So it gives me a good idea of, of where to start as well. But if we, uh, let's go back and let's talk about the next section is adapting the code, right? So working with device configurator, library management, and then in looking at specifically about changing the code size, the flash size in particular for the CM0. So inside of the Eclipse IDE, or sorry, inside of VS Code, um, I want to be able to launch the, the device configurator or the... Um, the, the library manager. And this is why I like to use the, uh, have the, uh, an open instance of the Modus shell available because I can easily type in from the directory where my project is, I can type in like make config. And this will open up the uh, device configurator tool. And because I'm launching it from that directory using the make files, it, it knows it can bring in all of the project files for me. It opens up references to the, the CPU files. Everything that I need uh, comes along with that simple command. The uh, device configurator is, is going to be very similar to what you might expect. I'm going to have uh, a list of the various peripherals. I'm in the this is the peripheral tab, so the various peripherals that are available. I can click on these and say, "How would you like to use?" In this case, this is a timer counter PWM. I, I want to use it as a, a PWM signal. I can provide a name that I can use in the code. Uh, these are all of the, the settings. Um, you know, what is the period, the compare, right? So I can create the duty cycle. What clock am I going to be using for it? 
and to set that up. And, and what this all generates is this is going to just generate a set of macros that I can use in my code. It's going to generate a large structure file. And these structure files are what the these low-level drivers, these PDL drivers, use to do the initialization. So I don't have to worry about, like, do I, did I get the right um, type, get all of the things populated? This tool will kind of guide me through that. On the pen side, very similar. We'll see a list, uh, a kind of a package preview of the device itself, mm -hmm. a list of pins that are available on the device. And because we're basing this off of a BSP, one of the Infineon dev kits, there's also a lot of names. And these are software macros that are provided. So see names like there's a an LED, right? Uh, this in this case, this is the the red, the RGB red LED that's available on the board. And I can use these terms inside of my code. And then on my actual project, if I need to change that to another location, as long as I'm using that name, that macro name, then that code becomes very portable. There's a graphical view of the analog system on the device as I make moder as I make um, assignments inside of the analog system. I'll see the connections being made here. Clocking, and I know this is probably hard to see um, inside of the view, but we see the different clock tree look at what's enabled, make modifications to the, the different clocks that I want to, to use. And then the various clocks that then get assigned to um, how they're used in the peripherals, and the different dividers that are associated with them. And a lot of this is kind of guided guided through um, the users can, can make those happen. Uh, so you saw how I launched it. Um, this was working with VS Code. Um, I launched it directly from um, the, the Modus shell tool. Um, there actually is for the, the library manager, there's actually a built-in task. So I can actually go in and, and look at the uh, look at the task. I can see library manager is built in the tool. Although I could do the same thing from the shell. Um, I could launch it and make mod libs. On the um, Eclipse IDE side, all of the links to these tools are built in to the device itself. So in this case, we've looked at the device configurator. Uh, let's now look at library manager. And I've got a uh, another application open. I've got a CapSense project opened up. So I wanted to specifically look at that one inside of the library manager, just because it's got some libraries that are already added to it. So as I will launch this library manager, um, I can see these files. And give it a second to uh, to cache in all of the uh, the various files from GitHub. Display those, so we can see um, the various libraries that are brought in. We can see that I've got uh, a free RTOS library, and as I want to add more libraries to my project, I can simply say I want to add a library, and we can see a, a large list of middleware and libraries. Uh, there's things for doing. Um, connectivity, right, whether I'm connecting to AWS or Azure, uh, some graphics platforms, MWIN, uh, file systems, whether it's MFile, LittleFS, uh, MCU Boot, MQTT, so lots of various libraries that we can use. Peripheral is going to have different libraries that target various sensors that are available either on the dev kits or uh, that can be attached, um, and several others, then Wi-Fi. So again, a lot of these will be dictated by the specific boards you select, but a large number of devices. Um, and you know what I just realized? Let me, let me actually open up this dual core. This is a single core example. Let me actually open up the dual core uh, example as well inside of the uh, library manager. Just because I, I want to make sure we see how um, the slight difference for dual core applications it will in when in the view itself it'll list out both cores and i can decide which uh, which core i want to add a particular library to so let's let it refresh real quick all right so now you can see um, in addition to the bsp i've got uh, two libraries that are available and if i select one of them then when i go into add library then that is adding it specifically to the CM4. And it, it references it up here. And if I selected the wrong one or I, I neglected to select one, which is, happens to me quite often, 
uh, this is a selection that you can say, oh, no, I actually want to add this to the CM0 and then make that selection as well. As you bring in libraries as well, it will add in any type of dependencies. So we'll add a free RTOS to my CM4. And if we bring that in, what we'll see happen is not only did it bring in free RTOS in the notes here, it lets me know that there are some dependencies. There was an abstraction RTOS layer. There was CLIB support. So it'll resolve any dependencies in the library and pull those in as well. And then we hit update and it'll bring those projects into the application. Now it's, it's brought those applications in, uh, but one thing that it has not done is it, it doesn't do the integration for us. So I just want to point this out. Um, anytime you're bringing in a piece of middleware or library from the library manager, those library files will come into MTB shared un unless we specified to, to go into it directly. And inside of each of these middleware folders, there is always a README file. And that's what I would showcase more and more or over and over again, that anytime you add a middleware library, uh, immediately go into the README file. Uh, this README file is going to contain uh, great information. And I'm going to open it up. I'm actually going to open it up in um, my system editor. Just it gives a little bit prettier of a view than it renders inside of the Eclipse IDE. But there's always um, there's always some type of an integration chapter or a quick start chapter that tells you what are the steps that you need to do to be able to integrate this library, this middleware into your application. Um, and free RTOS is no, no different. Um, there is a component in this case. There's a component that we need to add. Uh, specifically, it says we need to add this to the make file. Um, there, you'll real, com real commonly see uh, make file or uh, make file edits that are to add components as well as to add defines. Um, and I think there's a, there's some defines as well in some of the other IDEs or the other middleware. Those are, let's go actually back up to our project itself. And I'll, I'll highlight this one. So let's look inside. Inside of our each of our projects, there's a make file. So if we were adding free RTOS, into the CM4, we would look at the make file and there is a variable called components. There's a variable called defines. And so we, we would add, in this case, just following the documentation, you could cut and paste it, but we would add free RTOS as a component and that would tell our build system now to be able to pull in all the correct files, to be able to update any other code that we have to say, we are using free RTOS, so we wanna take advantage of it in the right way. So a, a key thing. Okay, so uh, we've, we've talked about the, the device configurator, the library manager. The next uh, piece was about expanding, giving our CM0 a little bit of breathing room. There are three main uh, aspects to um, expanding the flash size for the CM0. So the first one's probably very obvious. We need to go into the linker script file, the linker file for the CM0 and say, you have more flash. Um, these linker files are inside of the BSP itself. So we have a common BSP and we've got a, a CM0 plus CM0P component and a CM4 component. Um, we mentioned right there, there are multiple uh, compilers that are supported. The Eclipse IDE as well as the VS Code use the ARM GCC. And we'll find the linker file inside of this. So the first thing we need to do is we need to tell the CM0 that it has more flash. So we come down here, there's a little memory section. Hopefully you can, uh, this might be really small text, but hopefully you can see it. Right now it's got, it, as a default, it gives it about, I think it's about 17K. Um, so we can bump that up, maybe give it 32K. Um, so we're gonna increase the flash size for the linker file. So this will make sure that it builds with more memory. So. It's great, we've told the CM0 how much memory it has, uh, but we need to make sure that the CM4 now knows to stay out of the way. We don't want the CM4 code to write over this. Uh, so we need to keep these things in sync. So we'll look at the linker script file for the CM4. Again, I'm in the, this BSP folder in the CM4 folder um, under the right compiler. And if we scroll down a little bit, there's a, a flash size 
component. And this is, you can also look at the documentation. There's an application note that talks about dual core debugging. I know there's a blog article in the Infineon uh, community space that talks about this as well. But I need to say, this is how much flash size I reserved inside of the CM0 project itself. So they know to, when we do the compiling and the linking, to not step on each other. They, they keep their own space. Now, there's a third place that we do need to make a modification as well. Um, the way that the PSOC 6, these dual core devices, boot up is actually the CM0 is the primary core that boots up. So it boots up first. It will do all of the configuration. So anything that we specified or configured inside of the device configurator that will run on the CM0 for a dual core application. And then once it's done with that initialization, it's going to uh, issue a command to start the CM4 execution or to, to allow it to run. And we can actually see that. I'm going to open up my CM. I'm in the CM0 project. I'm just going to look at the main file real quick. And we can see that happening right, right here at the top. I'm at the top of main you will see a command that says uh, CY sys enable CM4. And it's actually passing an address. And this address is the very start of my uh, where my CM4 application is. So it knows where to, to the vector offset, where to jump into so that it can now um, start executing the CM4 code. And because we moved, we shifted the CM4 application over a little bit, we need to make sure that, that this variable um, is, is set up appropriately to be able to launch. And so that actually happens inside of the make file for the CM0 project. So we had this up a little bit earlier. You may have, have noticed it, but there is enough define. And here's our variable. This is our M4 application address. And we'll see here, this is that offset. And we need to would also change that to, in this case, the 32K, the hex 8000. So those are three places, right? Then that's the key thing, right? Especially as we're working with dual core application, you're going to find that, that, that the very minimal size that was by default associated to the, uh, the CM0 needs to, needs to be expanded. So those three places, make sure the linker file for the uh, CM0 is updated. Make sure the linker file for the CM4 knows to stay out of the way. And then make sure that the uh, actual application, the CMC or application knows how to actually start the M4 application. And it knows that starting address. All right, um, real quick, and I know we're, we're getting a little bit pressed for time, so we'll try to go through these next two pieces really quickly. Um, communication between cores. Um, there are, uh, we're using IPC. IPC is an actual hardware. Um, and we can access various documentations. The, the quick panel has documentation links for us. They're also available if you were to look inside of the folders themselves. So if I were to look at the, uh, the how or the PDL, I've got access to documentation. But these are easily accessible from this quick panel. And I can open up hardware extraction. There are IPs, um, or sorry, APIs that are available for this IPC communication and several other uh, details about them. So kind of a whole preview um, of how to use uh, interprocessor communication. There are examples of snippets on doing a binary semaphore. So this is very basic um, where it's kind of, I have control, um, you, can't, uh, you can't take control until I release control. And so the both cores can uh, kind of first come first serve, take control and use that. Um, the next level above that would then be message queues, where it's not just handing control back and forth, but it's handing its control with some type of a data. Um, I have a data piece for you or an array of data. I can put those into an array if I wanted to have kind of a FIFO implementation. Uh, very similar concepts uh, to what you would use inside of a, uh, an embedded OS or like a free RTOS, an RTOS. Uh, and, and where I will specify a queue, um, and this is a really good um, kind of code snippet to go into uh, the details on how to set that up. Um, and then going beyond that, we start getting into actual command pipes, um, and that's why I mentioned there is a code example that's available 
to, to see other code examples. We can also go into the Infineon GitHub repository. We've got links for all these in the presentation. You can even just search for IPC and see some of the code examples. There is a, a specific implementation for doing pipes, and this is actually actually issuing commands. So I can create a whole set of commands um, and issue those to the other core, and it can decipher the command and then execute the right code. So lots of lots of things from very simple um, semaphore implementation to to a much more complicated piece. Uh, and if we click on this. There's some good details, even some um, block diagrams of what's actually happening for this. So excellent resources to be able to leverage for getting that communication piece uh, up and running. Okay, so the last little bit that we wanted to cover then was the actual debugging. So we'll, this will be pretty quick. I'm going to do this in uh, VS Code. I've got a project that I was working with earlier. So let me just go to this and we'll switch over to this uh, dual core app. Uh, just a little bit about this application, because um, this is not one that uh, that I just pulled down from the uh, available code examples that are on GitHub. This is something I created, but um, I can't risk necessarily say I created it. I, what I did is I went and I looked at two different code examples that were available, a code example for doing cap sense uh, touch and a code example for doing just an interrupt-based GPIO. And both of those ran on the uh, the CM4, but I just kind of moved them around, and I just threw in code um, so that on the CM4 project, see CM4 project, I'm running CapSense in this case. And uh, so as somebody presses one of the buttons, in this case, this little block of code here, they're pressing button zero, and I print out a message saying button zero was pressed and I'm using semaphores. I use a set semaphore and then a clear semaphore. And the reason I'm doing that is because on the M0 side, I'm doing something very similar. Now, instead of using cap sense in this case, I actually have a, a GPI, a push button. So I've got a push button. As soon as I hit the push button, then it's going to do something very similar. It's going to, hey, it's going to check and say, is there, is the semaphore available? It's going to try to set it. If not, it'll, it'll wait. And then it's going to push out a string. And I'm using uh, the same UART because there's a, there's a UART that's connected to the debug on the board. So I'm using the same IP between different cores, and I don't want them to step on each other. I don't want, you know, one core to, to step right on top of the other one. So I'm using these, these semaphores. And uh, so I can put a, uh, a breakpoint. I'm going to add a breakpoint here. This is right when the CM0, when I push the button, it's going to try to print off the screen. This is right before it, it clears the semaphore. And let's add a breakpoint here as well, where I press 1. Now, in debugging inside of VS Code, this is enabled through a specific extension um, called the D Cortex Debug Extension. That's available in the... Uh, the market space for uh, VS Code. And we have a variety of debug extensions, and one of them is doing multi-core debug. And I'm using the uh, debug circuit that's on the device. This is a KitProg 3 uh, debug circuit. And so I can launch that debug configuration. And we'll give that just a, a minute to uh, recompile. and launch the session. And what we'll see, and this is a very similar implementation to um, the Eclipse IDE, right? We can also, I won't start a session, we'll just highlight the, the buttons. Um, but we select on the actual project itself and we can see the launch configurations, including one that is a, a dual core debug. And, and it'll be a very similar instance, right? Uh, it will launch the session um, it will initially hit the initial breakpoint uh, at the beginning of the CM0 project. Let's maybe rearrange these a little bit so we can see both projects. I think it's finished compiling and it's uh, loading it up now. It'll initially hit a breakpoint here at the, uh, the CM0 project because this is the core that's starting up first. Um, and we can actually see um, 
we can see the other course start. The other course won't be attached yet, but we can run that. And now we have a that initial breakpoint on the CM4 side. You can see right here where it stopped now. Uh, so both cores are in an active debug session. I guess technically the CM0 is in a debug session. The CM4, we show here, is, is, is being attached. Um, and then we can just go ahead and run it. I've got two breakpoints, and we're going to press the button. So this should have us hit the breakpoint on the CM0 side. And meanwhile, our CM4 is still running. And in fact, I can even hit a, I can hit the button, and you'll see that it did not. So I, I just pressed the button, and it did not hit the breakpoint because um, it's uh, the semaphore is not released. It's it's waiting. Um, now, when I step over this code or I'll run this code, we'll immediately hit the breakpoint because it will have released the semaphore, and we'll see that code get hit. Right, so here, I actually have my button get pressed. And if I, I don't have a terminal open, but we can see the terminal um, displaying these printf messages. But that's kind of the experience inside of, of, of debugging. I can actually step through based on which project I have selected. I've got individual toolbars up here. Um, I can step through the code if I need to um, or step into how to or just run the execution. And I'll press the button once again on the CM4 side. And we'll see we hit that breakpoint. So we'll shut down the, uh, the debug session. I know we're a little bit pressed for time there, but uh, we can switch back. Let me stop sharing. We'll switch back to the presentation itself. And uh, the demo gods were, uh, were kind to us today. They were kind, right? <laughs> I, I always try to put too much into it. Um, uh, last couple of slides that I have, and then we can try to answer some questions, and I'm sure we'll find a way to answer questions offline if we need to. Uh, this this slide deck is, will be available. We've got links for it. It's got a lot of resources inside of it. I've got links to go download the tools, links to go get the uh, the software, the, the GitHub repositories. So you can explore it. Um, where to to go do the different communities that are available on on NXP. The other thing, right? How do you get started with Modus Toolbox? Right? You can download a tool, but that doesn't mean you're getting started with it. Um, there is an excellent training resource. This is actually hosted in GitHub as well. You'll have links, but this is going to go through some of the basic getting started, right? What is Modus Toolbox? How do all these pieces work? Level two training is, is, is excellent, excellent, excellent training. It's going to go through and say, okay, how do you get something up and running? Let's go through an exercise of doing the blinky LED, of using a printf or a UART or CapSense, things like that. It's going to have great uh, tutorials. It's a manual. It's got code examples to go along with it. Excellent resource. And then as you even get more advanced, you get to level three. We start talking about Bluetooth connectivity. There are videos. A lot of these videos kind of coincide with the topics covered inside of this level two training, but it'll be basic how to walkthroughs on getting a, an LED, a PWM, uh, interrupt, things like that up and running. And then finally, right, where to go? Um, we'll do another plug for the design challenge itself, right? Go register for it, get your application submitted, uh, go download Modus Toolbox and, and check out all the, uh, the, the goodness there. So. All right, Phil, let's let's see if we can uh we got one minute. Let's see if there's any key questions we can maybe try to get to. Okay. Uh yeah, we we we're doing okay. Um yeah, so uh let's have a quick look. So slides are available after this event. That's uh, an easy answer, that one. They will be on the event page uh where you signed up for this. Um, what's the best way of getting started with Modus Toolbox? Well, pretty much grab the slides and click the links. Um, uh, what's the biggest difference between the piece SOC 62 and 63 from Steve? Yeah, so, yeah, so the 63 um, has a BLE. So the, the 63 follows in the BLE line. It has BLE integrated into the package itself. Um, although for a lot of the 62, if you look at the 62 boards, a lot of them are going to have Bluetooth uh, as well, but it's, it's a two-chip solution, right? So there's a little module with the chip and the Bluetooth. So 63 has got Bluetooth in package. Fantastic. Uh, Francesco asks, is BSP Assistant useful for custom board configuration? Yeah, that is exactly what it is for, right? So when I when I want to create a, a custom BSP, right, I have my hardware, my board, I'm going to use the BSP Assistant to then uh, create the BSP that, that has my configuration. It's got your 
um, pin configuration, your clock settings, the specific libraries that you want to have. And then I've got, I've got this BSP element entity that I can reuse in projects. Okay. Um, uh, is the middleware manager connected to a specific rep, uh, repository where developers can submit their own custom libraries? So today it really is focused to the Infineon GitHub. Um, that is an interesting question. And I think one that we continue to look at to say, how can we drive more community content and, and pieces like that into it? Uh, we do have a, a, a Modus toolbox and friends program that is really geared around partners who are contributing firmware um, and making that those middleware pieces directly available inside of the tools. Um, but it, it does require kind of a, a quality control check to, to add that integration, but it, Certainly, the future could hold all kinds of options for bringing in other libraries. Um, just a reminder, we do have a survey after this uh, webinar where if anybody wants to give any feedback or any suggestions to Infineon or ourselves, Element 14, uh, you can add them in there and they, they will be sent to the appropriate people. Um, Francesco, with another question here, uh, asking, when developing for dual core, is it necessary to flash two different firmwares yeah. or a device that accepts a single firmware or binary file? Yeah, so this, this is a good question. And in fact, I think one that, uh, you know, Modus Toolbox itself, the, the build system probably tries to protect you from, from having kind of an oops moment, maybe protecting you almost to the point where it becomes a little bit difficult to do something otherwise, but it is going to compile both applications and the build system itself will combine those into a single hex file and uh, program it to the target. So the, the build system itself is going to take care of all that for you, uh, but it's going to be inclined to always compile both applications, always combine them into a single binary, and then program to the board. Makes sense. And yeah, it stops people messing up. As well, yeah, and I, and I see, yeah, and I see there's also, I think Kamar is asking kind of the, the second question is it possible to program the, this only the CM4? And that's where it gets a little bit great. If we're working with a single core application, right, I, I think no, no problem. It'll kind of do that. But when we're working with dual core applications, Modus Toolbox is really going to try to protect you from, from accidentally getting things out of sync. And it's always going to kind of program the, the uh, program them together. Now, it is possible, but the, the default flows are going to be, hey, let's do both. And that, that's really important for the uh, at the core design challenge. Obviously, reminder links on the right hand side. Uh, Kumar again with uh, do the calls have the same clock frequency uh, to manage PWM signal and communications? Yeah, so so they are using different clock frequencies, right? You, you can get into the the clock configurator itself and see, but there they, uh, there there can be some different frequencies that are used between the cores, um, and and I think that uh, look, I've not i not paid too much attention to, to like syncing um, PWMs on different cores because I think they would potentially use different clock dividers across the cores. So, mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Uh, Mikhail asks about the PSOC 7, question mark, I, which yeah, I, yeah. Much, yeah, I, don't, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> the future holds all kinds of things. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know anything about a, a 7, though. <laughs> trying, trying to get the inside sneak there, love it. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, is some multiprocessor capable RTOS available for the PSOC six? So we don't have. So yeah, no, there's any? not a there's not a there's not a multiprocessor RTOS that is using it. And in fact, it, what we typically see is someone running the the RTOS on the M four core and then doing just bare metal on the CM zero. That's a very common. Um, kind of concept I've, I've not seen uh anybody using like a single instance of an rtos spanning both cores but hey maybe it may be a cool entry for the challenge <laughs> absolutely and finally uh, and what about threadx do you still plan to support it yeah so there is references inside and so out of the box right if you're using library manager um it doesn't have threadx built into it but i, th I think as mikhail's pointing out um, if you look inside of the uh, the RTOS abstraction layer that we do provide, you will see references to ThreadX um, so that there is some support from our middleware, uh, but that would kind of be your own integration of the, the OS into the environment, not something that would come directly from the library manager. Okay, fantastic. That's all the questions we've got uh, today uh, for the moment. 
Obviously, uh, this webinar has been live. The video on demand uh, is available and will be available in about five minutes from exactly the same link you chose to get here with. Um, just a reminder, with the uh, At The Core Design Challenge, uh, we are working alongside Infineon uh, and uh, some very, very cool bits of kit. We've got the PSOC 6S24 uh, uh, Pioneer platform that we are giving away. We are giving them away for free. Uh, and uh, the winners, if your uh, if your project, which is talking between the M4 and the M0 core as the main draw of the project, you can win uh, two Sonos speakers, a Microsoft Surface Platinum, uh, and for anybody that it doesn't finish, uh, for anybody that finishes a project and blogs it five times on the community. Uh, you will get a Fitbit for free for doing nothing other than building a project that uses both sides of the calls. So uh, please uh, check the link on the right-hand side. Clark, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for, yeah, thank uh, you for giving us uh, an, in, an interesting uh, and uh, very understandable for me uh, uh, webinar. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, right. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, please share this link with your friends and co-workers on the community. And uh, thank you very much, Clark. And we're going to wrap up here.